الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين صلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين so um, Somebody asked what was the third thing that made knowledge blameworthy. So it can harm somebody else, it can harm yourself, or there's just no benefit in it at all. It's a waste of time. Like trivial knowledge. There's people that know trivial things that have no... Aristotle said it's better to know a little bit about deep things than a lot about shallow things. So the next section uh, is the fourth chapter. We finished the first three. <clears throat> the fourth chapter is on Iqbal al Khalaq ala ilm al khilaf. He's going to go into the psychology, uh, the reasons why people have gone into uh, knowledge of differences and this obsession with, with differences. And then also to go into detail about the dangers of argumentation, dialectic, and when it is permissible to debate the conditions. So one of the things that he begins by just letting us know that the, the khilaf of the Prophet ﷺ, he said after the Prophet uh, left, and the Prophet ﷺ was not only uh, teaching uh, those things that are necessary to live a fully human life. So the Prophet ﷺ taught us how to pray, which is obviously devotion is our purpose, and so that's the most important thing. But he also taught uh, the, the things about eating, about dress, modest dress, eating uh, healthfully, uh, minimalizing what we eat, not um, eating too much. Uh, he taught um, how to interact with people, akhlaq, all of those things. But he also was a, a ruler. And he differs from Isa, for instance, in that, because Isa salam, never ruled. He was a prophet, but he never ruled. And that's why sometimes Christians will criticize uh, the Prophet salam, um, for aspects of his 
uh, his uh, life on earth. Uh, and those, those criticisms are largely due to the fact that he was a ruler. And so he made judgments that rulers make. And he made the best judgments because he was the best of rulers. But Jesus was never a ruler. So it's much easier uh, to have an idealized view of Christ in, in their mind because he, we don't know what he would have done had he been a ruler, had he had the power uh, to, uh, to act as a political leader as well as a, a prophet. But our Prophet Sallallahu did. He, uh, he had to deal with uh, military situations. He had to deal with treason, which is a capital crime in, in the governments of the world. So the fact that he had people put to death for treasonous reasons, people can fault him. That, that doesn't sound like a prophet. No, that doesn't sound like your prophet because your prophet was never in a position where he was forced to make a ruling like that. And, and, and so this is one of the aspects of our prophet that is, is very important to understand, that he wasn't just a religious leader. He was a military leader. He was a military commander. He was a political leader. He was a father. Jesus wasn't a father. Um, again, you can idealize people that don't have the problems that go with households. The, 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 the transparency of our Prophet is that his marital problems are in the Quran. And people say, well, why is that? Well, because that's part of life. And he came to teach us all aspects of life. And one of the aspects of life is sometimes you're going to have problems in the house. So how do you deal with it? Domestic violence? No. He, that wasn't his way. So th those aspects. So what he says is that the Prophet ﷺ was a political leader and then he trained these men who when they took power, they were capable of not only uh, ruling as politicians, but ruling as politicians following a prophetic methodology. And so Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman and Ali, and these are the four that are agreed upon uh, according to the Sunnah that they were uh, Mahdiyun. They were rightly guided. Khulafar Rashidun, Mahdiyun. And then uh, most of the ulama add to that uh, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz as a fifth exemplar. And then historically there have been others that come close to the prophetic model but don't go under the, that. They don't fall under that category that the Prophet ﷺ defined that we should follow their sunnah as well. Because why? Because they're on the methodology of the Prophets. So people like Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi is an example of a prophetic leader. He, he was following the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Uthman Dan Fodio in, uh, in Nigeria is another example of uh, a prophetic Amir who's, who's really a attempting as a scholar and as a statesman to implement the methodology. Salah al al Ayyubi is another example of that. As a, he's an exemplar of prophetic practice. Unfortunately, we have far fewer than we would like. Uh, uh, but our civilization in terms of just pure human legacy I think has far more examples of benevolent and enlightened leadership than other pre-modern civilizations so that that's also in our favor but it doesn't mean that there weren't serious problems so what he says is that they were able to judge as exemplars of the prophetic methodology so they didn't need recourse to ulama and so he said because of that reason the ulama were not involved in politics. They were involved in ilm al-akhirah. That's what their concern was. It wasn't about the dunya. And, but as these leaders who had knowledge began to disappear, then they began to rely on fuqaha. Because they were no longer faqih. Because according to our tradition, the um, imam should be a mushtahid. So the, the, the political leadership should actually be a mushtahid. He should be able to, get, to decide what the hukum shar'i, the legal ruling is in any given situation. That changed. But during the time, for instance, 
of the Tabi'een, they still had rulers, even during the Umayyad period and, and the Abbasid period, the rulers generally were highly educated Muslim scholars as well. And many of them loved the company of grammarians, of uh, literary scholars, poets, because they had great knowledge of, of language. Now, a lot of them can barely put two sentences together. In fact, some of them, if they just applied for a job as a doorman at a good hotel, they probably wouldn't get the job. It's amazing how they got into power, which shows you you know, you give dominion to whomever you please, including the gardener, you know, or the son of an Ethiopian shepherd. <laughs> huh? Amazing. You know, Obama in Ethiopia, because he's from Luo tribe, you know the Luo tribe is a tribe in Ethiopia, a Luo tribesman could not get elected president in Kenya because of his tribe. You can ask any person from Kenya, except maybe a Luo, but you ask everybody else, and they'll tell you that he couldn't get elected in Kenya just because of his tribe. But how, how do you, how do you get... To you give it to whomever you please. If that's not a proof of that verse, I don't know what is. I mean, a man whose middle name is Hussein and his last name rhymes with Usama. <laughs> Amazing. So what he says is that what happens is the fuqaha, when they saw, he's saying that, 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 that these ulama were distant from governments and, and they avoided Abu Hanifa. All of our imams, the four imams, all of them had difficulties with the government. All of them. People would not take judge. They wouldn't take, they didn't want to be judges. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, there's three qadis, two of them are in the fire. So two thirds of judges are in the hellfire. Not good odds. So nobody wanted to be a qadi. They didn't want to be a judge. Abu Hanifa, they tried to force him to be a judge. And, and he said, I'm not qualified. And they said, you're a liar. And he said, well, that proves I'm not qualified. <laughs> so uh, that's called the Cretans paradox in, in philosophy. Right? All Cretans are liars, said the Cretan. So if it's true, he's not lying. So. What, what he says, فَرَأَهْلُ تِلْكَ الْعَصَارِ عِزَّ الْعُلَمَاءِ وَإِقْبَالَ الْعَيْمَةِ وَالْوُلَاةِ عَلَيْهِمْ So people saw this esteem that these ulama, these scholars were held in by the rulers because they were distant from the rulers. They, they weren't after their money. They weren't after positions of power. And so the rulers, they had to honor them for that. And so... Because of that, so he says, الْعِلْمِ So then they begin to right, raise their necks. Like, hmm, that's something we should do. Because if we get that, we'll get the is. You buy the car, you get the girl that goes with it. It's marketing. Right? I mean, that's, that's all those commercials. So this is, they saw, oh, these ulama, look how high they're held in esteem. If we get the knowledge, that's going to happen to us too. So they sought knowledge for the wrong reason. And he said, this is the beginning of the, of the decline, right? Is that they, they, they wanted it for the wrong reasons. And then they tried to get near to the rulers. And فَأَصْبَحَ الْفُقَهَ بَعْدًا كَانُوا مَطُّبِينَ طَالِبِينَ After they were sought after, they become seekers after, after the dunya. وَبَعْدَ أَنْ كَانُوا أَعِزَّةً بِالْإِعْرَاضِ عَنَ السَّرَطِينَ أَذِلَّةً بِالْإِقْبَالِ عَلَيْهِمْ They were dignified in avoiding the rulers. Now they've become debased and degraded by seeking them out. إِلَّا مَنْ وَفَقَهُ وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي كُلِّ عَصْرًا مِنْ عُلَمَاءِ دِينِهِ Except for those who had success from Allah in every time. وَقَدْ كَانَ أَكْثَرُ الْإِقْبَالِ فِي تِكَ عَصَارَ عَلَى عِلْمِ الْفَتَاوَى وَالْأَقْضِيَ People wanted to learn fatawa and aqdiya, meaning the science of fiqh to give fatwa, legal opinion, responsa, and then also uh, legal judgments. I'll give you an example. 
In Mauritania, a lot of young students now, they go to learn Tuhfat al-Ahkam. Before they study the, like Khalil, and they want to learn the, how to be a judge. Because there's such a dearth of people that know this anymore. So if you, if you learn that and master that book, then you can get, for instance, uh, a job in, in, in the Gulf, in one of the Maliki countries or something like that. So that's an example where people used to study because they wanted to learn the knowledge, to be knowledgeable. And one of the nice things about the Mauritanian madrasa is the scholars traditionally did not necessarily go into knowledge uh, as, a, as a, a field. Many of them would end up becoming merchants or uh, they just went, they studied because they were Zawaya, because they were the Brahman of that society. And, uh, and they did it as, as a, um, a responsibility that they felt, that I should learn my religion. So when, that, when you lose that, then you get this problem. So he's saying that what happens is that people opened up the door of vying for positions. And part of this is the need to become adept at argumentation. Because you want to prove that you're better, that you know more than the other. Right? This becomes the competitive marketplace. And so things began to change. But, uh, and so he, he, uh, he then talks about that this is the main incentive behind this desire to learn all of these differences and the sciences of argumentation and the, 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 the nufus, the egos, began to incline towards those who had a lot of dunya um, and so uh, they wanted to prove themselves and so this is why they went this way. And so now he says, he's going to clarify what the telbis of this is. You know, in other words, how they've been tricked. Uh, into this. So he says, اعلم أن هؤلاء قد يستدرجون الناس إلى ذلك بأن غرضنا من المناظرات المباحثة عن الحق ليتضح. So they will fool the people by saying, no, the real reason why we're studying this is because we want the truth. And this is the way that the truth is made clear. فإن الحق مطلوب وتعاون على النظر في العلم وتوارد الخواطر وتوارد الخواطر مفيد ومؤثر that this is the way knowledge is increased and it's beneficial. And this is the way the Sahaba were. So in other words, what he's showing you is that they're, in order to get out of their cognitive dissonance, they're justifying in their own minds all of these things. But these are just justifications for going after dunya. Right? And so... Uh, and they'll say these are the things that are important to learn. So he says, وَيُطْلَعُكَ عَلَى هَذَا تَلْبِيسِ مَا أَذْكُرُهُ And now, if you really want to understand the deception behind this, I'm going to explain it now, how the deception works. So he's going to give you the psychology of, of why what they're saying is not true. وَهُوَ أَنَّ تَعَاوْنَ عَلَى طَرَبِ الْحَقِّ مِنَ الدِّينِ وَلَكِنْ لَهُ شُرُوطٌ وَعَلَمَاتٌ ثَمَانٍ he says, the ta'awun, the cooperation in arriving to the truth in this religion has conditions and it has eight signs. So if they're sincere, these conditions will be filled and you will see these eight signs. So, the first sign, al-awwal, an yashtaghal bi, alla yashtaghal bihi wa huwa min furud al-kifayat man lam yatafarraq min furud al-a'yan that he's not being preoccupied with it, knowing that it's a collective responsibility, and he hasn't fulfilled the individual responsibility. So that's the first sign. So somebody who's learning Tuhfat uh, al-Ahkam, which is a collective responsibility, and he hasn't studied the Fard uh, well enough. <laughs> And he'll say, no, but he's trying to get to the truth. He said, he's a kadhab, he's an inveterate liar. And the likeness of him is like somebody who leaves the prayer for himself. And he's, he begins to trade in cloth and textiles saying, people, my, the real reason I'm doing this 
is so that the people who pray will have, won't be naked. He's not praying, but he's saying, oh, the reason I'm selling cloth is so people that pray won't, uh, won't uh, be naked. Right? So it's the same thing. It's a trick. So that's the first one. And then he says the second, that he doesn't see the fard kifaya as more important than the munadhara. فَإِنْ رَأَى مَا هُوَ أَهَمُّ وَفَعْلَ غَيْرُهُ عَصَى بِفِعْلِهِ So, if, he's, if he knows that it's not more important and he still does it, then he's, he's betraying the reality of it. وَكَانَ مِثَارُهُ مِثَارًا مَنْ يَرَى جَمَعَةً مِنَ الْعُطَّاشِ أَشْرَفُ عَلَى الْهَلَاكِ وَقَدْ أَهْمَرَهُ مَنْ نَاسِ وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَى إِحْيَائِهِمْ بِنْ يَسْقِيَهُمْ الْمَا فَاشْتَغْرِ بِتَعْلَمَ الْحِجَامَةِ So the likeness of this guy is somebody who sees people about to die of thirst and instead of getting them water he says oh, I need to learn cupping because they need a cupper. And he says that the Prophet وسلم, and this, this is a very important hadith. And another one he says, and about fatwa, he says, you'll see people learning uh, how to give fatwa, and yet they don't have doctors in their area. So instead of studying medicine, which is a far kifaya, they're studying this, right? So ta'ayyan alayhi. Because a fard kifayah that's not fulfilled becomes a ayn. You see, it's an ayn on the people capable of doing it. So if a fard kifayah is not being fulfilled, if somebody's able to fulfill it, it's an it's an, it's a individual obligation on him. And if so, if he doesn't, he's the sinner. And he mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, uh, Anas relates that it was said to the Prophet, "Meta yutrak al amru bil ma'rufi wa nahyu an al munkari." When will people stop commanding, or when will uh, commanding good stop or end, and, and uh, forbidding evil will be left off? فَقَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ إِذَا ظَهَرَ الْإِذْهَانُ فِي خِيَارِكُمْ وَالْفَاحِشَةُ فِي شِرَارِكُمْ وَتَحَوَّلَ الْمُلْكُ فِي صِغَارِكُمْ وَالْفِقْهُ فِي أَرْذَالِكُمْ It's an amazing hadith. That when you see flattery in the best of you, when you see the best of you just flatter each other, and foulness in the worst of you, al fahishatu, and that's sexual deviancy usually, but just low class behavior, and then mulk becomes in the in the the least of you. Sigharikum, which could mean in age, it could mean in intellect, it could mean in, in stature. Sigar, just the, the least of you. So those who rule over you are the least of you. They're not the, they're not the best of you. Well, fiqhu fi ardhalikum. And fiqh is now in the, the lowest of you. And this is one of the big problems in our time with respect to people that study Sharia, ah, in most Muslim countries, in fact, I don't know of any exceptions with the exception of families, like Sheikh Muhammad Al-Aqubi, for example, comes from a family of scholars, and so his father made sure that he was a scholar. Uh, you, you'll find that. But generally, the people that go to Sharia ah schools and Sharia ah colleges are the people that couldn't get into any other schools. That's simply a fact. And it's a tragedy, but that is simply a fact. The third, أَنْ يَكُونَ الْمُنَاذِرُ مُشْتَهِدًا بِذَاتِهِ يُفْتِي بِرَأِهِ لَا بِمَذْهَبِ الشَّافِعِ وَأَبِي حَنِيفَةَ وَغَيْرِهِمَا حَتَّى إِذَا ظَهْرَ لَهُ الْحَقُّ فِي مَذْهَبِ عَبِي حَنِيفَةَ وَتَرَكَ مَا يُوَافِقُ مَذْهَبِ الشَّافِعِ وَأَفْتَى بِمَا ظَهْرَ لَهُ كَمَا كَانَ يَفْعَلُهُ الصَّ that he, the, the one who's doing this, he has to be a mujtahid. In other words, if he's really seeking the truth, the truth's already been established in the madhabs. So if you're not a mujtahid, you, you're supposed to follow an opinion that was done by a mujtahid. You don't have any business 
doing this. And this is very important. So the one who has not achieved this level of independent reasoning, and this is the ruling of all the people of our time. Then he is supposed to give fatwa, a legal opinion, from his, the madhab of whoever he follows. Even if he, it appears to him that his position is weaker, he should not leave it. So what's the point of his debating if his madhab is already known and he's not a mujtahid, so he's not supposed to go outside of his madhab. And this is the traditional position. This, and these are, these are the greatest ulama of our ummah have said this. Imam al-Laqqani, Ibrahim al-Laqqani, wa wajibu taqri, wa marikun wa sa'iru al-a'imma, kada abu al-Qasim, hudat al-ummah, fa wajibu taqridi hibrin minhumu, kada haka al-qawmu bilabdan yufhamu. That Malik and the other imams, he was Maliki, Malik and the other imams, that you have to follow one of them. Wajibun, right? Taqrida hibrin minhumu, that you have to follow one of them. And, and this is what the qawm, has, has said. Um, the ulama is what they've said. Now, in this enlightened time with all these great scholars, people are saying, no, you don't have to follow a madhab. <laughs> I mean, here's Abu Hamad al-Ghazali who wrote the book on usul al-fiqh, al-mustasfa. I mean, that's the, 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 the umda of usul al-fiqh is his book. The Hanbali Madhab, their book is, is uh, the book of Ibn Qudama, Rawdat al Nadir. You ask any Hanbali, which book did you study in Usul? If he's a Hanbali scholar, he'll say Rawdat al Nadir. What is Rawdat al Nadir? It's an abridgment of Imam al Ghazali's book. <laughs> uh, seriously, it's an abridgment of his book. He wrote the book on Usul al Fiqh. He could have made ijtihad, and he's saying, if you're not a mujtahid, you have to follow the opinion of the imam. Now people say, why is that? Why do we have to follow the opinion of the imam? Here's the hadith, here's the ayah. Why do we have to follow the opinion of the imam? Well, first of all, here's the problem. If you take any ayah and you ask uh, 10 people, even if they have, let's say they have a, a modern degree in, from a university, from an Arab country. You ask them, what does this mean? What does this verse mean? You're going to get 10 different opinions. It's just a fact. And a lot of them, they, they won't even, they won't know. And if you ask them to make i'rab of the ayah, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't. Just ask them. Right? Well, what is that? What, why is that like, la yinalu ahdi al mean? What's al mean? mean? What, what is that? What's ahdi? What's the ya called? I guarantee you, you ask uh, people, you'll see, right? So, if you don't have people that spent years mastering these sciences and you unleash this thing and say, everybody just work it out for yourself, you're supposed to be a mujtahid, not a muqallid, taqrid is madmum. It's true, taqrid is a negative term in our religion. It's a, it's a low maqam. <laughs> Right? It's not a positive term. But if you open this, if you unleash it and let it out, well, welcome to the modern world. Welcome to uh, the Islamic Dola of Iraq. Huh? Seriously, welcome to the Islamic Dola of Iraq. They're all, that's what they're doing. They're opening up. Oh, here it says crucify people. Let's crucify them. It says cut off their heads. Let's cut off their heads. Darb al-Riqab, ya akhi. Darb al-Riqab. Ma tafim? Raqaba. Darb. Huh? Seriously, it's a, it's a disaster. Ya khi fir Bukhari, Sayyidina Ali, go to every grave and flatten it. Ish hadha, Mawlana Rumi, ish hadha. Haram ya khi. Wallahi, shuf al-hadith, fir Bukhari. It's right there. The Prophet told me to go and flatten every grave. Why? They were the graves of the mushrikeen and Najd that they used to worship. That's what they're doing here. 
So shall you, anybody here worshiping that grave? Did any? I never saw a Muslim uh, <laughs> worshiping a grave. I, I never saw that. Really, I saw some people doing stupid things. That's true. I saw uh, once somebody making tawaf around a grave. That doesn't mean he's worshiping. I made tawaf around the Kaaba. I'm not worshiping the Kaaba. <laughs> Seriously, it's a bid'ah, muharrama, and you should tell him to stop. <laughs> but you don't blow it up. <laughs> so this is the problem. If you don't follow these rules, and then they say, oh, you know, those madhabs, they were good for that time, we're in a new time. That's true, there needs to be tajdeed, but who does it? Who does it? Every Tom, Dick, and Abdullah? Is that, is that who does it? Seriously, who does it? Some guy that has a four-year degree from Al-Azhar? Who does the ishtihad? That's what he's warning against. So this is a major problem that we have. You know, if you're not a mujtahid, you have no business doing this munadhara. Know your place. Even the angels, they say, everybody has a maqam. What's your maqam? Part of being a, an intelligent human being is knowing your place, is knowing where you fit in the scheme of things. And arrogant people always put themselves above their place. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said in his qawaid that من يدعي رتبة ليست له فضح بشواهد الامتحان Whoever claims a station, a rank that's not his, God will expose him. You claim to be Firqa Najiyah, you claim to be the sole group that's saved, Allah is going to expose you for the, for the liar that you are. Right? You claim to be uh, this, that, or the other, Allah will expose you, simple as that. And He said, whoever claims a rutbah, a rank that's his, it'll be taken away from, from him for claiming it. If you say that you're the only one doing Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi an Munkar, nobody else is doing it, maybe you are. But just because you claimed it, it's going to be taken away from you. Simple as that. That's the way it works. That's, this is qaida. And he said, if you claim a rank less than your own rank, Allah will elevate you to a higher rank. If you humble yourself for the sake of Allah, Allah will elevate you. So that's that's important. وما يشكر عليه يزمو أن يقول لعل عند صاحب مذهب جوابا عن هذا فني لست مستقلا بالاجتهاد في أصر الشرع. And anything that you is problematic for you in your madhab, you should say, maybe he knew something I didn't know. لقد حفظت شيئا وغابت عنك أشياء. You know something, but you, a lot of stuff you don't know, right? I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example, just one example. You know, you, you see people uh, in, in, uh, that criticize Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu. And, and these modern people, they criticize Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu because um, he'll prefer qiyas in situations over uh, singular hadith. Um, or Imam Malik radiallahu anhu will prefer the amal of Ahl al Medina over single hadith. Uh, these, these aren't ignorant people. They didn't arrive at these conclusions uh, happenstance. I mean, this came after great, great study, great deliberation, great intellectual gifts. And they came to those conclusions. And the Ummah said, you're justified in that conclusion because you are a mujtahid mutlaq. And so we have to, even, even if my madhab doesn't agree with his madhab, with his conclusions, we have to say, but the nature of the world, you can't, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to, uh, you know, to, to please people, it's an end that you'll never achieve. Like Joha and the donkey, you know, he, he's, he, he's, he's riding the donkey, his son sitting next to him, so he passed by some people and he said, uh, the people said, look at that man, no compassion for his son. Young boy, he's riding the donkey, the boy's... Johas says, okay, he gets off, puts the boy on the donkey. They go past another group of people. Astaghfirullah, look at that boy. No respect for his father. Doesn't he have birr al-walidain? So, 
Johad takes the boy off, and, and, and then they're just walking along. They say, look at those idiots. Perfectly good donkey, and they're not riding it. So he gets on with his son. They're both riding it, passed by some people. Astaghfirullah. Don't they know the Prophet ﷺ said you shouldn't give a, a, burden, a beast a burden more than it can bear? Joha, he felt like putting the donkey on his back at that point, right? So that's the reality of people. You can't, you're not going to please people. And then if you tell them, this problem is an ancient problem. Zamakhshari, I mean this is somebody 6th century. Zamakhshari, he said, إِذَا سَأْرُ عَنْ مَذْهَبِ لَمْ أَبُوَحْ بِهِ وَأَكْتُمُهُ كِتْمَانُهُ لِي أَسْلَمُهُ if people ask me about my madhab, because he was Mu'tazilai, if people ask me about my belief, I just k keep it to myself. I, it's safer for me to do that. فَإِنْ قُتُ حَنَفِيًّا فَإِنْ حَنَفِيًّا قُتُ قَالُوا بِأَنَّنِي أُبِيحُ لَهُمْ قِدَاهُ وَشَرَابُ الْمُحَرَّمُ If I say I'm Hanafi, they say, ah, you, he permits uh, alcohol. Because Abu Hanifa said Nabid was permitted, fermented uh, Nabid. Right? So if I say I'm Hanafi, they say, ah, he permits alcohol. وَإِنْ مَارِكِينَ قُلْتُ قَارُوا بِأَنَّنِي أُبِيحُ لَهُمْ أَكَلَ الْكِرَابِ وَهُمْ هُمُ And if I say I'm Maliki, they say, ah, he permits eating dogs. And he said, and they're the real dogs. Right? Because Imam Malik, the dog is makru in the Maliki Matab. He said, وَإِنْ شَافِعِينَ قُلْتُ قَارُوا بِأَنَّنِي أُبِيحُ لِكَحَ الْبِنْتِ وَالْبِنْتُ تَحْرَمُ And if I say I'm Shafi'i, they say, ah, he permits marrying daughters. Because, and everybody knows the daughter is haram. And that's a mas'ala daqiqa in the Shafi'i madhab about illegitimate children, even though the person knows it's an, it is the valid marriage, marriage contract valid or not. And then he said, When Hanbaliyan qudtu qalu bi anani thaqeelun, hululiyun, baghidun, mujassimu. And if I say I'm Hanbali, they say, he's like heavy, uh, hululi. You know, believes that God moves in space, uh, you know, hateful and, uh, and anthropomorphic. And if I say I'm Salafi, uh, they say, you know, he's like a, 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 a goat. He doesn't understand anything, right? That's a, that's a <laughs> sixth century. It's all the same stuff, right? Everybody calling the other person names. This is, now they have internet to do it. It used to be you had to look for somebody. Now you can just tweet it out, you know. Get ghibah with... Now, I mean, just imagine the angels, what they're having to deal with now. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, you know, okay, one ghibah, he told so-and-so this. You know, they just write it down. Now they must have computers themselves <laughs> to keep track of all this ghiba, because it's like, now you do namima to, I've got, you know, uh, 10 million followers on Twitter, you know, oh, so-and-so's this, that, and the other. And now, so you just did ghiba to all those people. SubhanAllah. So he says, إِنِّي تَعْجَبْتُ مِنْ هَذَا الزَّمَانِ وَأَهْلِهِ فَمَا أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَلْسُنَ النَّاسِ يَسْلَمُوا I'm amazed at this time how nobody's safe from the tongues of people. Right? He's saying that then. I'm amazed at this time, how nobody's safe from the tongues of the people. Uh, and then he says uh, that, وَقَدَّمَ مَعَشَرًا وَآخَرُ آخَرًا عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُمْ وَآخَرَنِي وَقَدَّمَ دَهَرِي مَعَشَرًا وَآخَرَنِي so my time has put forward some people and held me back because I know and they don't know. Like, so because I'm knowledgeable, I'm held back because they're ignorant, they're put forward. That's what he's talking about, his own time. And then he says, uh, uh, So since these ignorant people have become so prominent in this age, I've realized I'm a meme, like I'm the letter meme, and the time I live in is aflah a'lam. Aflah, he doesn't have an upper lip, uh, lower lip, and a'lam, he doesn't have an upper lip. So they can't pronounce meme, because it's a harf shafawi. So he's saying, I'm a meme, 
and I'm living in a lipless age. <laughs> they can't pronounce me. Yeah. So he says, The fourth is that he shouldn't talk about something that hasn't happened or it's about to happen. And this is the min minhaj of the, the ulama of the past. Imam Malik used to be asked questions. He said, a, a, a Did it happen yet? They said, No. He said, When it happens, come ask me. That's what he would say. In other words, I'm, I'm not going to theorize about something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, And the Sahaba, he says, used to gather together and they would discuss uh, events and come to conclusions about them. The fifth one, he says, أَن تَكُونَ الْمُنَاظَرَةُ فِي الْخَلْوَةِ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ وَأَهَمَّ مِنَ الْمَحَافِلِ بَيْنَ أَذْخُرَ الْأَكَابِرِ وَالصَّلَاطِينَ The fifth is that these discussions should be in private and not in public. They should be kept in private. Right? If you're really out with sincerity to, to make a change or something like that, you keep these things to yourself and you address the people that they involve immediately. You don't put it out into the public. Because when it's in private, it will gather you. You'll be in a gathered state. And there's purity of, of thought and reason. And it's easier to achieve the truth. But when you're in, in a large group, then the ego wants its portion. And وَيُجِبُ الْحِرْصَ عَلَى النُصْرَى And this means that you're covenous to win. Because you don't want to make yourself look bad in front of a lot of people. مُحِقًّا كَانَ أَوْ مُبْطِرًا Whether they're right or they're wrong. وَأَنْتَ تَعْلَمُ أَنَّ حِرْصُهُمْ عَلَى الْمَحَافِظِ وَالْمَجَامِعِ لَيْسَ لِلَّهِ And you know that it's not sincere. That this is about popularity. وَأَنَّ الْوَاحِدَ مِنْهُمْ يَخْلُ بِصَاحِبِهِ مُدَّةً طَوِيلًا فَلَا يُكَلِّمْهُ And he'll be with a person in private and he won't even speak to them. But then when they go out in the public forum, they start talking. So why won't he speak to them in private? The sixth one. أَنْ يَكُونْ فِي طَالَبِ الْحَقِّ كَنَاشِدِ That in seeking the truth, he's like somebody who's looking for something lost. لَا يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَنْ تَظْهَرَ الضَّلَّةُ عَلَى يَدِهِ أَوْ عَلَى يَدِهِ مَنْ يُعَوِّنُهُ He doesn't care who finds it. If you're looking for a camel, and some Bedouin finds it, you're going to be happy that he found it. For it's your camel. You're going to be happy because that's what you're looking for. But in this situation, no. You want to win the debate. If you were sincere, you wouldn't care whether you won or he won. And that's why Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu said, I never argued with anybody except I actually asked Allah that he would put the truth on his tongue so that I could submit to it. Because he knew that the, the nafs had a portion. It's a whole other level. That's sincerity. فَانْظُرْ إِلَى مُنَاظِرِ زَمَانِكَ الْآنِ كَيْفَ يَسْوَدُّ وَجْهُ أَحَدِهِمْ Look at them in their debates and argument, how they get angry when somebody else has a stronger argument and they become ashamed. وَكَيْفَ يَشْتَهِدُ فِي مُجَاحَدَتِهِ And how with great effort they strive to negate it. وَكَيْفَ يَذُمُّ مَنْ أَفْحَمَهُ طُولَ عُمْرِهِ And then after that he speaks ill of him for the rest of his life. Huh? I mean, he's, this, is, this is a man who's, who's telling you from experience. He's not making this stuff up. He lived this world. This was, he's talking about himself. That's why it's so real. Because he knew this, this intimately. The seventh, That he doesn't prevent him from going from one proof to another proof. Or from one problem to another problem. And this is, uh, th this is in the rules of debate. Because very often they would, they would say, no, you can't introduce that. So this has to do with the rules of debate. 
Um, and it's again, he's just using it as an example of, uh, of this desire to, if they were really looking for the truth, they, they would allow uh, the person to introduce evidence in all situations. The eighth, and you know that man yatuqa al istifada minhu mimman huwa mushtaghirun bil ilm. That he debates the one who he thinks he can benefit from because he's preoccupied in, in knowledge. Well, غَارِبُونَهُمْ يَحْتَرِزُونَ مِنْ مُنَاظَرَةِ الْفَحُولِ وَالْأَكَابِرِ Usually these people avoid debating people that are really knowledgeable because they don't want to look like fools. So they look for people that they, they can defeat them in argument. فَيَرْغَبُونَ فِي مَنْ دُونَهُمْ طَمَعًا فِي تَرْوِيجِ الْبَاطِلْ عَلَيْهِمْ and then he said, other than these eight, there are also other conditions that are very subtle, but these are the ones that should let you know what is for God and what's for some other reason. If you understand these, you'll know when you see people debating. And then he says, وَعَلَمْ بِالْجُمْلَةِ أَنَّ مَنْ لَا يُنَاظِرُ الشَّيْطَانِ وَهُوَ مُسْتَوْلًا عَلَى قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَعْدَ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَزَالُ يَدْعُوهُ إِلَى هَلَاكِهِ ثُمَّ يَشْتَغْرُ بِمُنَاظَرَةِ غَيْرِهِ فِي مَسَائِلَ الْمُشْتَهِدُ فِيهَا مُصِيبٌ وَمُسَاهِمٌ لِلْمُصِيبِ فِي الْأَجْرِ فَهُوَ ضُحْكَةٌ لِلشَّيْطَانِ وَعِبْرَةٌ لِلْمُخْرِسِينَ وَلِذَلِكَ شَمِتَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِهِ لِمَا غَمَسَهُ فِيهِ مِنْ ظُلُمَاتِ الْآفَاتِ الَّتِي نُعَدِّدُهَا وَنَذْكُرُ تَفَاصِيلَهَا فَنَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ حُسْنَ الْعَوْنِ وَالتَّوْفِيقَ So no in summation if you're not fighting shaitan and he's, he's got your heart, he, he has occupied your heart. If you're not fighting shaitan and he's occupied your heart and he's the worst enemy that you have and he's calling you to your own destruction and then you're preoccupied with debating other people, about issues that the mujtahid is musib, or he's musahim, or he shares in the reward if he's not, because the musib gets two rewards, and the, the wrong one gets one reward, so they both get a reward. So you're worried about this, and your own heart's in peril? He said, you should know, you're just a joke to shaitan. You're a joke to shaitan. You're nothing. And you are a, a lesson. You're an ibra. You're a wondrous lesson for the people of sincerity when they see you. And that's why shaitan laughs at you. He's joyful at your loss because he has, he has immersed you in the darknesses of these faults that we have just enumerated. And now we're gonna go into their details. And we ask Allah for good benefit and tawfiq. So now he's going to go into the details of this. So, اعلم وتحقق أن المناظر الموضوع لقصد الغربة والإفحام وإظهار الفضل والشرف عند الناس وقصد المباهات والممارات واستمالة وجوه الناس هي منبع جميع الأخلاق المذمومة عند الله المحمودة عند عدو الله إبليس ونسبته إلى الفواحش الباطنة من الكبر والعجب والحسد والمنافسة وتسكية النفس وحب الجاه وغيرها نسبة شرب الخمر إلى الفواحش الظاهرة من الزنا والقذف والقتل والسرقة The amazing statement Know that this argumentation and this love to overcome your, your uh, interlocutors or whoever you're uh, having disagreements with and, and this love to show your nobility over these people, your fadl over them, your uh, love of being in these positions and your desire to attract people, their attention and pull them to you this is the source of all foul character. This is it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Mahmood and the Aduwila. This is everything praiseworthy 
according to the enemy of Allah Iblis. This is what he loves. And its relationship to the internal foulnesses is the relate from arrogance and vanity and envy and vying, all of these things, hubb al jah, love of stature, love of position, all of these things is the same as the relationship of alcohol to all of the outward things like fornication, calumny, slander, murder, and theft. And just as the one كَمَا أَنَّ الَّذِي خُيَّرَ بَيْنَ الشُرْبِ وَسَائِرَ الْفَوَاحِشِ أَسْتَصْغَرَ الشُرْبِ فَأَقْدَمَ عَلَيْهِ And just as the one who's given a choice to drink alcohol or murder or steal or something is going to choose alcohol over them because he doesn't understand the nature of alcohol. That's what leads to these other things. He diminishes the significance of alcohol because he doesn't know that it's Umm al khabaith He said the same with these people who diminish the disease that he's just enumerated for the very same reasons. Because this is what, just as alcohol engenders all these other foulnesses outwardly, this is what engenders all those negative qualities inwardly and there are many verses, and you will see in Rubat Muhnikat, in, in, in the fourth section, in the, in the quadrant that deals with destructive matters, you will see. So, now let's look at what this love of debate uh, engenders. The first is envy. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Hasadu Ya'kul al Hasanati Kama Ta'kul al Nar al Hatab. That envy devours or consumes good deeds just as dry wood is consumed by fire. So you become envious. Because sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses. Sometimes people praise him, other times they praise somebody else. So he becomes envious of those uh, who have some benefit over him. And this is a great tribulation. And Ibn Abbas said, خُذُ الْعِلْمْ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُ وَلَا تَقْبِرُوا قَوْلَ الْفُقَهَاءِ بَعْضِهِمْ فِي بَعْضِ فَإِنْهُمْ يَتَغَايَرُونَ كَمَا تَتَغَايَرُوا التُّيُوسِ فِي الزَّرِيبَةِ He said, take knowledge wherever you find it, but don't listen to the fuqaha when they talk about each other. Because they are more jealous of each other, like goats are jealous in the corral. وَمِنْهَا تَكَبُّرُوا وَتَرَفُّعُ عَلَى النَّاسِ Arrogance. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ تَكَبَّرَ وَضَعُهُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ تَوَادَعَ رَفَعُهُ اللَّهِ Whoever is arrogant, Allah will abase him. And whoever lowers himself and humbles himself, Allah will elevate him. قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ سَمْنِ حِكَايَةً عَنِ اللَّهِ الْعَظَمَةُ إِزَارِ وَالْكِبْرِيَاءُ رِيَائِ فَمَنْ نَازَعْنِ فِيهِمَا قَصَمْتُهُ That magnanimity is my izar is a metaphor, is my izar. And exaltedness is my rida, it's what the upper, the, you know, when you have, go on hajj, you have the rida, the one you wear at top, and the izar, the one you wear on the bottom. So he's saying, th these, this is what covers Allah, his, his magnificence. And he said, so whoever attempts to vie with me in one of these two things, I will break his back. Allah says, I will break his back. And he said that you'll see the Munadhar become arrogant about his associates and his peers. Uh, and they, they will vie for positions. And he said sometimes the stupid crafty one amongst them, Al-Ghabir Makkar, you know, like he's stupid and yet he's clever at the same time. al khadda He's a mountebank, fooling people. He will say, I'm just trying to protect the dignity of knowledge. And then he'll say, And he'll say, the, the mu'min is said not to abase himself. And so he'll call humility degradation. Even though Allah commanded to humility. 
وعن التكبر الممقوط عند الله عز الدين and he'll call arrogance dignity تحريفا الاسم uh, distorting the name وإضلالا للخلق به and leading people astray and this is what they've done as we have mentioned earlier in hikmah and knowledge and other names another one the حقد which is resentment it breeds this resentment and the Prophet Sallallahu said المؤمن ليس بحقود the believer is not, he doesn't, he doesn't resent, he doesn't have resentment towards people. And haqood is, is a hyperbolic. وَرَدَ فِي ذَمَّ الْحَقْدِ مَا لَا يَخْفَى And there are many, many uh, things that have, we've been told about this. Another one is ghiba. وَقَدْ شَبَّهَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِأَكْلَ الْمَيْتَى And Allah has likened it to eating dead flesh, carrion. لَا يَزَالَ الْمُنَاظِرُ مُثَابِرًا عَلَىٰ أَكْلَ الْمَيْتَى and you will see these debaters, these people that are arguing with others, they're always eating their flesh. He'll just talk about the, his enemy and he'll blame him and, and, and he'll uh, tell things, he'll even lie about things. Uh, and so this is all, it's either ghiba or buhtan. He'll either tell the truth and Twitter, I mean, there, there's an example where people say things, the most egregious things about people, especially about the ulama. You should just shut up about the ulama. You know, they have their hujjah with God. You know, the best thing, if you don't agree with them, explain why you don't agree with them. But to call them names, you know, I mean, that, that's... That, and I'm talking about specifically, we can talk about ulama generally, that we have a problem, undeniably. But to take somebody who has a position that's different from your position and to attack them and to say this, that, or the other about them, they made their ishtihad. That's with God. They made their ishtihad. I'll give you an example. Qada Iyad, when, when, when Qada Iyad was, was uh, with the Murabit Sultan and they heard uh, Abdul Mumin give a speech. He said, uh, he said, اقتلوا, اقتلوا He told him, he said, kill him and his blood is on me. That's a alim who told the ruler to kill that man, who gave a wow. He came and gave an exhortation. He said, kill him and his blood is on me. And he didn't do it. He ended up overthrowing the, the ruler and created a big fitna. The rest is history. But there's an example where the alim, he gives a fatwa, and he's saying, this is my ishtihad, I'll take the responsibility for it. So you can disagree with them. I can say I don't agree with what he did, but to say he's a jahil, if he's, if he's a scholar, he, if he's a real scholar, to say he's jahil is wrong. And one of the things Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya said, he said there's no such thing in our religion as ulama sultan. He said that, la tanabzu bil alqab, don't call people names. There's, there's alim, and he's either mukti or musib. And he said, you have to look at his fatwa, what he's saying. Is it based on reality or is it not? But to say that uh, the alim is simply, no, he just sold his deen or something like that. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. But you look at what his, his, the, he said. Look at the fatwa. Assess the fatwa. As a scholar, you're supposed to look at the fatwa. Is it based on reality or is it not? If it's not based on reality, then clarify that. But because the fatwa goes against what you like and you say, Adam Sultan, maybe he made an ishtihad that you, you're not, you didn't grasp. And this is a big problem in the community. And we have now, there's just so much anarchy and just madness. And the ulama are, they're as confused as everybody else. That's a bad sign. The ulama, you ask the ulama, they're, they're like, their heads are spinning too. Don't think your heads are the only ones spinning. Their heads are spinning. I sit with them. <laughs> they're like, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> what do you make of it? I don't know. Right? <laughs> People ask me like, what do you make of so-and-so? I don't know. I don't even know what I make of myself. Are you asking me about so-and-so? I'm trying to work myself out. We have to have more compassion for people, human beings. Yeah. I mean, you have people, 
people got upset with, uh, uh, you know, like Imam Majid. You know Imam Majid in the United States? People got upset that he went to the White House, you know, at this time because of the Israeli thing. Yeah, it's bad. You know, I got invited to that thing. I didn't go, right? I already went once. It caused me enough problems. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, look, I know Imam Majid. I know him personally. And, and, I, and I'm honored to call him a friend. Imam Majid is a very sincere person, as far as I can tell. I have no reason other than to assume that he's a sincere person. You know what Imam Majid does when he flies? This is true, you know. When he flies on long journey, he does khatam of the Qur'an on the journey. Wallahi, he does that. He teaches, he's a humble man, he's one of the humble people. His father was a Qadi. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyat knows his father very well. He does things that are very difficult for me, like I, you know, I wouldn't want to do them, but he doesn't. In the United States, you can say, why is he going to the White House? A'udhu billah. Hadha shaykh. Tayyib. We're, we're, we're probably at least six million Muslims in the United States. We have to have some level of engagement. Somebody has to be, t <laughs> to be talking to these people. Some, I don't want to do it, but somebody has to do it, or else we're completely marginalized. We now, in the United States, for those of us living in the United States, the latest Pew poll, we went from 40% that have a favorable opinion of Muslims to 20% since the last poll. Things are looking bad in the United States, right? So people say that, that you know, he's not brave enough to speak up. Just going into the White House, you're putting a target on your back from the Islamophobes who wrote the next day that uh, terrorists are in the White House. That's what they did. So they're calling him terrorists. Now you've got nutcases in the United States that say, oh, he's a terrorist. Let's go get rid of him or something. Seriously, the reality. And then you've got Muslims attacking him. So for me, you know, I, I say we should honor people like that that are trying to do their best because I really believe he is. That's his ishtihad. Maybe he's wrong. It's possible. He could be wrong. But that's his ishtihad. He's a scholar of some merit. And that's his ishtihad. He's saying, I think in my situation, this is the best thing that I can do for the Muslim community. And I should trust his uh, sincerity. I can say, you know what, I disagree with him. I think we, he should have boycotted it. But he made his ishtihad. The one who makes it ishtihad and he's wrong gets a reward. And the one who makes it and he's right gets two rewards. So he gets one reward, but if you attack him and criticize him, and, he's, and his niyyah is good, then that's not a good thing. Uh, in, in 1953, in July of 1953, Dr. Saeed Ramadan um, went to the White House with an Ikhwan delegation, right? It was arranged by uh, people in intelligence in the United States that thought it was important for the White House to engage the Ikhwan al-Muslimin. So he went there. That was his ishtihad. There's people, there's books. I read a book called The Devil's Game claiming that these people were agents of the CIA. I don't believe that because I actually met the man. I met Dr. Ramadan, Saeed Ramadan. I actually read his PhD dissertation that he did at a European university. I don't think he was. I think he was making an ishtihad. He went into the Eisenhower White House at a time when Eisenhower was undermining the democratic government of Iran. He was undermining the democratic government of Iran. They overthrew Mossadegh. He was directly involved in ensuring Israel's success as a state. Eisenhower, Truman acknowledged it. it was the first thing, 11 minutes after Israel declared its independence, Eisenhower was the first. 11 minutes, they didn't even waste time. 11 minutes. That was a quick council. They acknowledged, and this is fresh. All these Muslims got thrown out, but he thought that it was probably good at that time to go into the White House because he had some strategic vision. Right? That was his ishtihad. Maybe he was wrong. 
But that was his ishtihad. The only one that's going to judge us is Allah. Thank God. <laughs> really, thank God all these people on Twitter are not my judge. Right? Thank God. Right? The only one that's going to judge us is God. And ashaqaqta an qalbihi. Did you open up his heart? Did you look inside his heart? Did you determine what was in his heart? What his niyyah was? Husn al Khasratani laysa fawquhuma. Wa khasratani laysa shay'un fawquhuma min al khayrati yuhmadu. Husn al dhan billahi thumma bil ibad fakunhuma wa jannibana lil inad. There's two qualities, there's no better qualities than these two qualities. Having a good opinion of Allah and having a good opinion of the servants of Allah. We're all trying. And we should, we would hope that, you know, Muslims just, we need to unite. At least be united in acknowledging that people come to different conclusions about situations. We're all trying. You know, for me, I'm teaching this stuff because I think this is the most important things that Muslims need to be thinking about. Because I look at the Muslim world and I see people cutting people's heads off. And I see people rioting in the streets. And I see angry people. And I see people taking a 70-year-old ruler and, and sticking a knife up his backside, you know, uh, out of rage and anger. And, and I don't see the Prophet coming into Mecca. I don't see Salahuddin al Ayyubi coming into Jerusalem. I don't see Amir Abdul Qadir al Jidani, uh, Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, dealing with French prisoners with such dignity that they even went back to France and had to praise him. I don't see that because the tarbiyah that those men had was this tarbiyah. And this is, this is what I want to see. I want to see when we do finally go into Jerusalem that we don't slaughter people. Seriously, that's what I want to see. When we do finally go into Jerusalem, that we don't slaughter people. That we have the prophetic character. Now we have the power. This is the time to show Rahmah when you're in power. That's the time to show Rahmah. They didn't show it with us, they're not our teachers. Well, they do it to us. They're not our teachers. Our teacher is sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That's our teacher. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ It's a mercy. The Prophet forgave people. Um Jamil used to put thorns on his path. And the wind would blow it away. One day he came out, there were no thorns. He went to see if she was okay. She was sick that day. So he visited her. It was his aunt. SubhanAllah. Where is that? Where is that akhlaq? Where is the akhlaq when people spitting on him, throwing rocks at him, his, his feet are bleeding, and the angel comes and says, you want us to smash these two mountains? Wipe them all out? No. I want to see their children pray. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a different, uh, it's just a different perspective. That doesn't come from haqad and bughad and hasad. That, that's not where it comes from. It comes from something else. You know, you actually care about people. Even the bad people, you wish for them good. The Prophet didn't wish for people destruction. He wanted their salvation. That's what he was concerned about. He didn't want to chop heads off. He wanted to enlighten heads. He wanted to restore them. You know, that's who our Prophet is. And I don't see him being represented anywhere in our Ummah anymore. I don't see it. I, I wish I could. I wish I could say, you know, look, this is Islam. Here it is. This, this is Islam. I can't, where can we point to and tell these people in the West, these ignorant, People, they're, they're ignorant. You know, they're really not, they don't know anything. Where can you point? You know, you can point to the Taj Mahal, to the Topkopi, you know, point to the Blue Mosque. Those are stones. Where are the hearts that built those stones? Where, where are those hearts that that beauty came out of? Where are they? 
That, that's what he's talking about. But it's not easy. He, he was so fed up with himself that he had to go into retreat for 10 years. <laughs> but that's why we're here teaching his book. <laughs> All those people that attacked him, the people that burnt his books, we're not teaching their books. You know, the Warghiali, the, the Mufti of Fez, the Imam of the Qarawiyin, the esteemed scholar of his age, the one that gave the fatwa to persecute the Jews, he's not the one honored today. It's Ahmed Zarruq that said it's, it's wrong. We need to, to protect the Jews. He's the one honored. Not the one that said, steal their goods, go into their houses. That's what they did as a pogrom in Fez. It's one of the great disgraces of Moroccan history. But Ahmed Zarruq said, it's wrong. That's who we honor today. Everybody was against him when he was alive. And that's why only history, history is going to, you know, Allah will judge us, but it's the people that come later that, that can sort out all this mess. Not the people alive today, because everybody's got nafs, everybody wants to be on top, everybody wants their position. But we're all just doing ishtihad. That's all it is. We're, we're all trying our best. And just acknowledge it in the other. It's not my ishtihad. I think you should be doing something else. But if that's what you think you're doing, it's your life, you have to live it. And then also, you think you're better than other people. Allah says, Don't say you're better than other people. Right? Don't, 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 uh, don't, make fun of a group, right? <coughs> Don't let one people make fun of another people. <laughs> Maybe they're better than them. Allah knows, we don't know. <laughs> Everybody works on what he thinks is the best thing to do. Did you know that that's the eye that's written around the, the green dome? <laughs> Everyone is, is working according to their own understanding. Sahaba went to war with each other. They had different ishtihad. They were, you know, people have differences. Women had tajissus with tatabu awrat and nas. And then you start spying on people, following their uh, things. He says, even it gets to the point where they, they look at their inclinations, they see faults in their, their body. Like he says, they point out their baldness. <laughs> there are people that do that, right? I mean, look at all these uh, horrible people on Fox News and things. You know. <laughs> And then, وَمِنْهَا الْفَرْحِ بِمَسَاءَةَ النَّاسِ وَرْغَمْ بِمَسَارِّهِمْ They get happy when bad things happen to people and they're depressed when good things happen to them. SubhanAllah. That's a real sickness. People should love for their brothers what they love for themselves. So, to not be happy about good things happening to them, فَهُوَ بَعِيدٌ مِنْ أَخْلَاقَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ It's very far from the character of the believers. وَكُلُّ مَنْ طَلَبَ الْمُبَاهَاتِ بِيَظْهَارَ الْفَضْرِ يَسُرُّهُ لَا مَحَارَةَ وَمَا يَسُؤُ أَقْرَانَهُ وَأَشْكَارَهُ الَّذِينِ يُسَامُونَهُ فِي الْفَضْرِ وَيَكُونَ تَبَاغُضُ بَيْنَهُمْ كَمَا بَيْنَ الضَّرَائِرِ They hate one another like second, the, the multiple wives hate each other. كَمَا أَنَّ إِحْدَى الضَّرَائِرِ إِذَا رَأَتْ صَاحِبَتَهَا مِنْ بَعِيدِ when one of the co-wives sees another co-wife from a distance, she starts, her shanks start to shake, and her color in her face changes. And this is the same with these men, when they see one of their enemies. It's as if he saw a shaitan 
uh, or a, 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 a dangerous uh, animal, a lion or something, ferocious lion. فَأَيْنَ الْإِسْتِئْنَاسِ وَالْإِرْسْتِوَاحِ الَّذِي كَانَ يَجْرِ بَيْنَ عُلَمَاءَ الدِّينِ Where's the, the intimacy that scholars have when they meet? Where's the brotherhood? Where's the being happy for the other and being sad for their difficulties? Imam al-Shafi'i said, الْعِلْمُ بَيْنَ أَهْلَ الْعَقْلِ وَالْفَضْرِ رَحِيمٌ مُتَّصِرٌ Knowledge between virtuous people and people of intellect is like a womb that binds them. They're like brothers and sisters from the same womb. Just like you differ with your brother, but he's still your brother. Right? Yeah. You shouldn't have become a gas station attendant, you should have been a doctor. He's still your brother. Even if he didn't do what you thought was best for him. وَمِنْهَنْ nifaq. And we don't need to bring any ayahs and, and hadith about this problem. Hmm? That's what he says. He says, these are the people that sweet talk you with their tongues, they show you their love, and then they get behind your back and it's a whole other thing. إِذَا تَعَلَّمَ النَّاسُ الْعِلْمُ وَتَرَكُوا الْعَمَلُ وَتَحَابُوا بِالْأَلْسُنُ وَتَبَاغَضُوا بِالْقُلُوبُ وَتَقَاطَعُوا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأَصَمُّهُمْ وَأَعْمَى أَبَصَارُهُمْ It's a Hassan, he says, Imam al-Hassan uh, mentions this. Uh, Imam al-Tabarani relates it and Ibn Asakir. Um, and it has, uh, it's in the Musnad. He says that, if people learn knowledge and they stop act, acting according to it and they love one another with their tongues and they hate each other with their hearts and they sever their kinship bonds, God will curse them when that happens. He will blind them and uh, make their words have no effect. And he said, وَقَدْ صَحَّ ذَلِكَ بِمُشَاهَدَةِ الْحَالِ He said, whether the hadith is sahih or not, we see, we witness its truth by the conditions that we find ourselves in. وَمِنْهَا الْإِسْتِكْبَارَ عَنَ الْحَقْ وَكَرَاهَتُهُ وَالْحِرْسُ عَنَ الْمُمَارَاتِ فِي And from it also this arrogance and hatred and, and, and uh, loving this argumentation. Our Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَاءَ وَهُوَ مُبْطِرٌ بَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بَيْتًا فِي رَبَضَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever leaves off argumentation uh, and he's wrong, in it, Allah will build him a house in, in the middle of paradise. وَمَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَاءَ وَهُوَ مُحِقٌ بَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بَيْتًا فِي أَعْلَى الْجَنَّةِ And if he leaves it and he's right, Allah will build him a place in the highest point in paradise. <laughs> and also الْرِيَاء وَمُلَحَذَةَ الْخَلْقُ وَالْجُهُدْ فِي إِسْتِمَالَةِ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَصَرْفِ وُجُوهِهِمْ Also, ostentation, eye service, uh, noticing creation, being concerned about what they think, uh, and also uh, trying to get people to incline towards you. And he said, this is a deep disease. So these ten things that he's just mentioned, he said, these are ummahat al-fawahish. These are the matrices, matrices of foulness, the internal foulness. This is where it all comes from. And he said, now listen to this. I mean, really. Listen to this. Sometimes people come to me and they say, these are for the cool, calm, and collected ones. As for the ones <laughs> that start hitting each other and throwing things at each other and ripping the clothes and grabbing their beards and cursing their parents and cursing their teachers and, and slandering them with calumny, with open calumny, we don't consider these people. <laughs> we don't give them any consideration. I'm talking about the uqala here <laughs> that have these 10 qualities. These are the uqala from them, <laughs> not the ones that are chopping off heads. Naam, qad yasumu ba'adhuhum ma'an ba'adhiha ma'man 
فهو ظاهر الانحطاط عنه أو ظاهر الارتفاع عليه وهو بعيد عن بلده وأسباب معيشته ولا ينفك أحد منهم عنه مع أشكاله المقارنين له في الدرجة And then he says Yeah, it's true Some of them don't have all of these qualities ثم يتشعب من كل واحدة من هذه الخصال العشرة عشر أخرى And then there's ten that come out of these also uh, And he talks uh, about those um, and then he says that, uh, and if you say, you know, it's permissible to do this and there's benefit in it and it helps people studying knowledge and if it wasn't for love of leadership, knowledge would have disappeared. He said, what you're saying is true, but it's not beneficial. It's the same as saying, if we didn't promise children uh, ball games with their sticks and, and, and toys, and, and things, they wouldn't go to school. Right? He says, If you didn't tell them, oh, you're going to get to go playground and have recess and you'll play games, if you didn't tell them that, they wouldn't go to school. So he's saying, that's not saying those are the good things that they should be doing. And then he said, and don't forget, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna Allah yu'ayyudu hada din bi aqwam la khalaq lahum." Allah will help this religion with people that have no character. There's no portion of the uh, of the akhirah. They have no portion. Wa qad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Inna Allah yu'ayyudu hada din bi rajal al fajr." Allah will support this religion sometimes with a foul person. So seeking leadership is destructive. And then he says, in the end, the ulama are three. Muhrikun nafsuhu wa ghayruhu, the one who destroys himself and others. Wahuman musarrihun bi qarab al dunya and muqbirun alayha. These are the ones that are just after dunya and you see them chasing after it. They destroy themselves and they destroy those who follow them. Wa imma musaidun nafsuhu wa ghayruhu, and those who help themselves. And help others. And these are the ones that call to Allah and they're free of dunya inwardly and outwardly. And those who destroy themselves but help others. And those are those who call to the akhirah and they reject the dunya outwardly. But his real niya is that people accept him and he gains stature from it. Fandor min ayir aqsam anta. So look to yourself. Which are you from? Wa man alladhi yashtaghalta bil i'tidadi lahu. And what have you been preoccupied in preparation for? Wa la tudhunnanna anna Allah ta'ala yaqbiru ghayr al-kharisi li wajhihi. And don't think in any way, shape or form that Allah accepts anything other than the one who is sincere solely for his face alone. Ta'ala min al-ilmi wal-amri wa sayatika fi kitab al-riya'i bal fi jami'i rub' al-muhlikat ma yanfi anka al-ribata fihi al-ribata fihi insha'Allah ta'ala. And you will see in the chapter on ostentation or eye service in the quadrant of the quarter of muhlikat, the destructive things, what will negate these things. So that's the fourth book. We have the fifth book now. So we have three more books. Uh, and we'll do tomorrow, uh, insha'Allah, uh, al-bab al-khamis, ten branches for a student. Uh, this, uh, and this is about learning. So any, uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah. With regard to argumentation. With regards to argumentation, um, does the Imam speak about only scholars, or is it can it be used? He's, as he's, a... he's talking about in for common people. Yeah, it's haram. He's talking about ulama. <laughs> like common people should never argue about the religion because they don't have the requisite knowledge to do it. Uh, what about using it as a, uh, as a as a tool for critical thinking? So it set aside. You're, it's a really good question. The next chapter deals with that, about when it's appropriate to, to challenge or to, to ask a, a scholar question. 
and things like that. So it's a good question, but, and tomorrow, inshallah, he'll deal with it in that chapter, but, but it's an excellent question. Um, so we read last night, one shouldn't delve too far into any science. Doesn't attaining mastery of a science entail having to study a subject as far as possible? People, what, he's, he's really talking about, he's a man who mastered all the sciences of his age. He had a real mastery. And he has a beautiful uh, Arabic style. It's, it's quite stunning, given that he was a, a Persian um, and learned Arabic as a second language. His, his mastery of Arabic is really phenomenal. Uh, and he uses words beautifully. His syntax is beautiful. It's actually not that difficult to learn this Arabic. It's, it's not a, a difficult Arabic, but it's very eloquent. It's difficult to reproduce, to write like that. It's called the Sahal al mumtana in Balagha, the easy impossible. Um, but he, he, uh, he mastered all the sciences. At the end of his life, he's saying, look, I'm giving you good advice. Don't waste your time like I did. Because you don't know when you're going. And the most important thing is, is this. But he was definitely a scholar. He, he, he spent his life teaching and studying. Scholarship was very important to him. And, and, uh, and so he's not in any way saying don't study. He's just saying don't be one of these people that learns all of these things that are not, they're just not useful for you. you. Learn useful things. Learn useful knowledge. The Prophet sought refuge from knowledge that didn't benefit. Allahumma inni asiruka inman nafi'an. I ask you for beneficial knowledge. And that's his point. And so, uh, you know, we need grammarians. We need people to master the Arabic language. It's a jihad to master the Arabic language. You're protecting the religion. You're protecting knowledge of the Quran and the Hadith, which we need in every generation. It's a fard kifaya. Uh, we need qiraat. We need people to master the qiraat. It's hard to do. It'll take you many years to master all ten variants. But somebody has to do it. So you, there are people that have to delve deeply into those sciences, undeniably. Um, that's important. And people, Allah pr preserves the deen and the Quran. So he, Allah tawalla amrahu. We sent this dhikr down and we will protect it. And he protects it by producing in every generation people that take it upon themselves to learn the religion to the best of their ability. That this knowledge will be carried in each generation. Uh, upright people. They'll, uh, they'll negate the 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 the, uh, the interpretations uh, of the extremists, uh, the decontextualization of people attacking it. Intihad and muqtinin means like people that take things out of context in order to undermine your religion. They'll defend it against that, and the t uh, the uh, the uh, interpretations of ignorant people. So, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, what is your what is your advice for mothers? I just feel like it's too late for me. I'm not really gonna be a scholar, mm -hmm. but it would be an honor to raise a child who is worthy of the deed. And it's just hard and not to feel lost and not to know what to do and how to raise a yeah. decent human being. Yeah. It's, yeah, we're up against big challenges, my sister. You know, really, we're, I have my children. We're up against big challenges. It's not easy. Um, it's hard to be human today. It's really difficult to, to be a human being. Uh, and, and our fitra is under real attack. Uh, you know, a lot of this technology, we're not, we're not designed for it. You know, Allah did not design us. And we were warned about these, these times, these latter times, when there'd be a lot of fitna, a lot of confusion. We were warned about them. So these are our times. It's a good time to be alive because it's our time. And it's the time God gave us. You know, we just, we have to do the best that we can. And trust in God. I mean, you know, when you tawakkal ala Allah, if you really trust in God, He's enough for you. These, these eyes are real. 
they're, 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 they're metaphysical truths, just like physical laws. You know, every, 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 uh, you know, every body at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by a body in motion. That's a, that's a physical law. You know, the cups at rest. I moved over here. That's physics. There's metaphysical laws as well. If you have true taqwa of Allah, He will give you an exit strategy. If you're worried about your children, Allah says, have taqwa, and He will take care of your children. You know, I, my own teacher, My teacher, uh, he had, he had uh, three sons and a daughter. Uh, his daughter ch died in childbirth, and she only had <laughs> one child. And uh, he's just an am amazing scholar. And he was raised without his mother and without his father he was raised at his grandfather's and just amazing man but you know one of his sons went and joined the army and went to Iraq and studied and came back and just very different from the path of his father but his all his father did was do dua for him marab al-hajj and he was actually put in prison and then um they had a trial and they were all sentenced. And this is a true story, I'm, I'm not making this up. They, they had a trial and, and every time, you know, they, they would put all the names down and then the man who typed the names out would bring them. And the name of Marab al Hajj's son was missing, wasn't on there. He said, go write, write it again. And he'd do it again, he came back, it wasn't there. After three times, he just said, leave the Wali's son alone. And now he's a very, he's very pious, very righteous man. All his sons became scholars, you know, and he didn't do anything other than dua. Rabbahum bid dua. And, and that was the tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ. Rabbahum bid dua wa nadara. You know, he, that's the way the Prophet. So we have to trust in God. Istainu bi sabri wa salat. You know, really take help from prayer and, and, you know, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, he said, people, when they see their children growing astray, they, they, they fall apart. And he said, they should go to God because he, th their hearts are in God's hand. You can't go and tell them because you raised them. And they're, they're not following what you obviously didn't raise them to go astray. But if they've gone astray, you have to go to God because he's the one that can rectify. And he will. He'll rectify uh, our children, you know. And then there's some like Nuh alayhi salam, khalas. You know, his, son, his son didn't get on the boat. So, uh, but you know, you don't. This this is a lot of this is scholastic learning, my sister. And trust me, you can be a scholar of what he's talking about is ulama billah. And you don't have to know very much. But if you know God, you know everything, really. So there were plenty of Sahaba that were true scholars of, of God, but they didn't have a lot of outward knowledge. And if you love uh, the scholars, then inshallah Allah will make one of your children a scholar. Like he made this man, his father was a poor uh, wool carter, but he loved the ulama. He died when his son was less than seven years old. And, and look what Allah gave him. I mean, what, what's his reward going to be on Yom al Qiyamah? You know, when he sees his son. You know, one of the men that burnt uh, his book in Fez, he actually saw the Prophet in a dream. <laughs> and the Prophet brought Imam al Ghazali and he gave him a whip. And he told him to whip him. The next day he made public toba. 
is amazing. So, and that's one of the miracles of our religion is the Prophet ﷺ is actively engaged in our community. He comes to people in their dreams. You know, he gives them succor. I mean, I, I had a woman, this is a true story I'm going to tell you. I, you know, I don't usually talk about these things, but I had a woman who came to me and she said, We were in Medina, and she just said, you know, I have a really hard time with Aisha's age. You know, I told her, I said, listen, first of all, there's, there's debate about her age, all right? And, uh, and I said, but the important thing about Aisha, if Aisha was an insignificant person in the history of Islam, then, then we would certainly have to question what the wisdom was. But the fact that she carried so much of the religion, you know, you, it's undeniable that she, Allah chose her to be in that position. Whether she was 12 or 16 or 18, there are different narrations. Or whether she was nine, that, was, that wasn't a problem for uh, Irving Washington who wrote a biography of the Prophet, which is not very flattering, by the way. But when he got to that section, he just said, uh, Arabian women were known to be very precocious, they matured early, so this was not uncommon. It didn't bother him in 19th century America, early 19th century America. But today it's very uh, bothersome. But anyway, so I gave her, you know, my, the best I could do. So about, I think about a week later, we were in Medina, because we were in Mecca when she brought up the question to me. She came to me and she had like tears. And I said, well, what's, what's the matter? She said, no, no, I just wanted to let you know. I just, I feel so at ease. She said, uh, you know, I've been so troubled about this. And she said, the Prophet came to me in a dream last night. And he explained to me why he did that. And he said, and he said, it was, he said Abu Bakr was honored by becoming his father-in-law because Abu Bakr's maqam was so high with, with Allah. You know, that, and she had that in a dream, you know, but she was totally, her heart was just set at ease. I just thought, subhanAllah, you know, what a gift to be troubled by something and, and the Prophet comes to you himself to ease your heart. And that's from ikhlas. Which means that it doesn't mean that you can't question things. You know, our religion has never shied away from, from questions. But question them with a desire to know the truth, not a desire to challenge the truth. Awanam yeah. Tu'man, don't you believe? That's what Allah asked Ibrahim. Don't you believe? He said, no, I believe. I just still my heart. So he showed him. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, shalom, la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirullah.